Next, find out how baseball changed forever when it came to Columbus. Then we serve up some tennis history and how it thrived on the east side. And a peek at the heyday of Ohio Roller Derby. That's Columbus Neighborhoods next, so stay tuned. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarter city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're talking about sports today, and whether it's baseball, tennis, or roller derby, they all left a mark here in the city. Despite the summer heat, parks like Goodell were always packed with kids playing all kinds of games. And what was your favorite sport? I'm sorry, have you seen me run? <laughs> <laughs> Mine was flag football. Well, let's start today with one of America's favorite pastimes, baseball. Local historian Joe Santry tells us that Columbus was the place that forever changed the game. The 1800s were really the beginning, and baseball evolved. Every year, the rules changed a little, the players got better, the ballparks got better. This was what set up it becoming the national pastime. It was the work of these early pioneers. Baseball began around 1845 as a New York game. It remained a regional pastime until the Civil War when soldiers from all over embraced it as a way to kill time when they were in camp. Every town formed a team. Now Columbus, the first team created was the Columbus Buckeyes. And they played the first recorded game on April 6, 1866 at Parsons and Broad Street, which was the grounds of the Franklin County Insane Asylum and the first team beat the second team 95 to 44. Six teams were organized that first year. The names of some city leaders who played are recognizable today. Chittenden, Neal, Dennison, and King, for instance. People from all walks of life joined the teams. One of the teams, the Capitals, had a young man named P.W. P.W. always batted last, and he always played right field. At the end of the season, he gets called into the manager's office and, and we were imagining what it would be like. Uh, PW, thanks for coming out. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We hope you had fun too, but don't quit your day job. So he created a bank. His name was PW Huntington. Now, the guy who always batted ninth has his name above the ballpark. Columbus had six teams when the National League was formed in 1876. But when they were trounced by a team from Cincinnati, they decided to consolidate so they could be more competitive. Jimmy Williams organized the Columbus Buckeyes, an all-professional team. In 1877, the Buckeyes played in a seven-city league with teams in the United States and Canada that Williams created. In 1883, Columbus made the big leagues. Williams secured a franchise for the Columbus Buckeyes when the American Association expanded from six to eight teams. Well, the first year they didn't do really well, but uh, the second year they finished in second. On that team was uh, Eddie Cannonball Morris. 
he was the greatest left-handed pitcher of the 1800s. He was one of the very first pitchers to throw overhand. He threw overhanded and uh, the umpire read the rule book and he goes, doesn't say he can't do it. And when he stood on Recreation Park's pitching square, he faced west. And so when he threw the ball, it came out of the south. One of the local sports writers called him a southpaw. And the name has stuck for every lefty ever since. One of my very favorite people on the Buckeyes team, his name was Eddie Dummy Dundit, which was sort of an irony. They weren't really politically correct passing out the nicknames in the 1880s, but the irony was, is he was actually the valedictorian of his school, the Ohio School for the Deaf and Dumb. Dumb meaning not that you weren't intelligent, but that you couldn't speak because you couldn't hear. Their philosophy was to raise deaf children as closely as they could to hearing children. Well, that included playing sports. So they formed the very first Ohio high school baseball team. Of course, there was nobody to play. There no other high school had a team. So they played the colleges, Ohio State, Ohio Wesleyan, and they got pretty good. And they traveled the eastern United States and they actually beat major league teams. Eddie was the first to play in the majors, but he had a problem. When he would slide into second base, he couldn't hear if he was out or he was safe. So he worked out some hand signals with the umpires. They might go, you know, whoa, Eddie, stop there, you're all right. Or Eddie, you're out, go back to the bench. Well, he played for 10 years and his teammates played for even longer. Now they go, you're safe and you're out all because of their handicaps. The 1883 and 84 Buckeyes, we were arrested for playing baseball on Sunday. There was a big, big meeting at City Hall, and on one side of the aisle were all the pro baseball people, and all the other ones were the pro blue law people, and it was almost violent. And finally, a very elderly man stood up. His name was William Deschler of the Deschler Hotel thing. And he stood up and goes, gentlemen, this is ridiculous. He goes, how about if the players agree not to play on Sunday, we let them out of jail and we'll just forget the whole thing. And they did. But the problem was, is in 1884, everybody worked six days a week. And Sunday was the only day they had free to go to a ball game. So the finances of the team went right in the dumper. The team never recovered from that event, and the Columbus Buckeyes were sold to the Pittsburgh Allegheny Club. Today, the Allegheny Club, with roots in Columbus, is known as the Pittsburgh Pirates. We didn't have a team for two years. And then in 1887, we joined the Ohio State League, which was a minor league. That team, 70 years before Jackie Robinson, we had an African-American player named Jay Higgins. Jay played third base and center field and catcher for us. In fact, there were a number of African Americans in the Ohio State League. The Columbus Salons re-entered the American Association in 1889. In 1891, a proposed merger was going to shut out four teams, but one of the owners, Ralph Lazarus, committed a costly error. The National League wanted Columbus, but Earlier in the season, Ralph Lazarus got in an argument with Chris Vanderall of the St. Louis Browns. He was the owner for them. And he just punched him right in the nose. A uh, pretty good right hook. At the end of the season, Vanderall went around to all the American Association owners and asked them, how much do you want for your team if you're one of the guys left out in the cold? And everybody wrote the figure down and so he had all the teams. So when the National League wanted Columbus, he goes, I have the proxy for Columbus, they're out. And so we lost our major league team. Once again, Columbus was left without a professional baseball team. In 1896 through 1899, Columbus played baseball in the Western League, a high minor league. In 99, there were hints that the National League was going to drop four teams and go back to an eight-team league. The man who ran the Western League was named Ban Johnson, 
and he takes the Columbus team to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is in the low minors, and took the low minors Grand Rapids team and brought them to Columbus. Well, this angered the Columbus fans. In 1899, the National League had a message for four teams. You're out. The Western League moved into those cities and was renamed the American League. By 1901, it was considered a major league. And that former Columbus team that was moved to Grand Rapids, they made one more move. And today, they're called the Cleveland Indians. Next, it's a baseline view of Eastside Tennis and how it thrived in the community. And the Ohio Roller Derby skates in with its own brand of jamming through history. In the 1950s and 60s, tennis courts were filled to capacity all over the city. And there was a thriving group of African Americans enjoying the sport in Columbus. A lot of that action took place at Beatty Park in a close-knit community of athletes. For decades, a lot of people considered tennis a country club sport played by the privilege. In spite of that, or maybe because of that, tight-knit tennis clubs sprang up in African American neighborhoods across the country. In Columbus, the Beatty Tennis Club was founded in 1949 at a park in the city's thriving African-American neighborhood. You know, we had our own uh, tennis facility because, we, you know, there was no tennis for a lot of people, you know, of color, you know, back in the day. Stephen Rius grew up in Mount Vernon, Ohio, and, looking for more competition, started coming to Beatty Park to play around 1970. He writes about those days in his memoir. This, these were places where we could play, you know, Wolf Park or Beatty. I, I mean, most of the time I played here, you know, and we would like get together on Sunday or a Saturday and we would play here. Uh, again, like I said, the courts were clay. We didn't have enough money to have hard courts. They were just hard and we rolled them and stuff and they always made us kids do it. Sometimes we would, you know, eat uh, in uh, the center right there or we would go to one of the guys that lived close and then have dinner there. You know, it, it just depends on, uh, you know, uh, what we want to do that day. If it rained, then we would go to somebody's house because some of us, you know, I came from Mount Vernon to come here and play because there was no other place to play and, and get some competition and, and, and maybe get some tips, you know, just to get your game better. I had never had a lesson in my life, you know, uh, just some of the guys here, you know, that would help you out, uh, um, that would, would help you with your strokes or just give you a uh, little hints of what to do. It was just a really a, a, a neat situation to come over and, and, and feel, you know, comfortable and not uncomfortable some other place. Beatty Tennis Club teams traveled to tournaments across the Midwest. And one week before she made her historic appearance as the first African-American woman to play at the famed Forest Hills Courts in New York, Althea Gibson played a tournament at the Beatty Courts. Things were changing in Columbus, too players who once had been limited to the courts at Beatty Park began playing elsewhere. And, and, and maybe there was a little bit more of, a, 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 of acceptance to play anywhere, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things uh, like uh, people weren't paying their dues and this and that. And, and, uh, and then things changed. We were allowed to play all over the place. You know, when uh, Beatty did kind of like, you know, you know, die a little bit, there was still a lot of activity at Wolf and it was like mixed. The Beatty Tennis Club remained active until 1983. Today, a community tennis organization plays at Wolf Park on East Broad Street, but many young people are drawn to other sports. I mean, we're still not seeing a lot of, you know, you know blacks on, on the court. It is an expensive, court. It's an expensive sport, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, they're gonna definitely play basketball or uh, something else. Uh, with their friends and stuff, because they can't. I mean, all you need is a basketball. You can make, you can work on your skills. In his memoir, Rayus writes about growing up in a small town where he was often the only African-American in his class or on the courts. He says the Beatty Tennis Club helped him learn how to play and how to make his way in the community. You, you, were, you were not ridiculed or, you know, uh, people uh, bothering you about playing tennis and stuff. And uh, that was kind of cool, 
You know, that's what was so good about Beatty, you know, uh, and, and, and Wolf Park to this day. I, you know, people still, a lot of people are still going down to Wolf Park, but there's all kinds of colors now. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know. Everybody's just picking up a game. It, 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 it's all, it's, it's black, white, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's uh, again, I, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody. Craft beer is big in Columbus. Ever wonder how we ranked alongside big brewing cities like Portland? Find out about that story and more at Curious Sea Bus, where you submit a question online, and if voters agree, we report the story together. Look for stories, submit a question, or log on for a voting round at wsu.org slash curious. Any mention of roller derby now brings up the new movement of girls on skates going fast and furious. But origins of the sport trace back to the 1930s when outside races came indoors and someone came up with the bright idea to make it a contact sport. Here's a behind the scenes look at the Ohio History Connection to see what's happened to roller derby in the last couple of decades. Hello. Hi, Brent. How, How are, are you? you? I'm great. How are you? Doing fine, thanks. You know, I know a little bit about some sports, but I think I know nothing about this sport that you've uh, got some items from that you're going to on display here. What, a, a roller derby? That's right. Yeah, these are some pieces uh, in our collection that are related to uh, the Ohio Roller Derby. Well, who knew there was roller derby in Ohio? Has it been around a long time? So this league actually formed in 2005. Uh, it was Ohio's first modern roller derby league and it's one of the original members of the Women's Flat Track Derby Association which is kind of the governing body for uh, roller derby. So is it women skating in this league? Are they the ones doing the action? Yeah, so women are the skaters but um, there's also men I involved as well as, as far as coaches and referees and uh, other volunteers involved. So I is this legitimate or is it uh, kind of like some forms of wrestling that's theatrical? So I think that's a uh, misconception about the sport of roller derby, one that um, is rooted in some of the earlier forms of the sport, you know, from, um, you know, the 1970s, for example, kind of like that wrestling on wheels concept. Right. But modern roller derby, as we know it now, is most definitely a legitimate sport. The participants are definitely athletes. They're always working out and always trying to kind of move the sport along. Is it a match? Is it a game? What, what do you call a roller derby engagement? So it's called a bout. That's, okay. the, that's the name that they, they use. And re remind us how you score a point and how you score points. So what's the object of the, of the, of the bout? So a uh, roller derby bout, of course, takes place on a flat oval track. You have two teams that will field five skaters at one time. Each team will put up to four blockers on the track at once. I remember that, yeah. Yep. And each time, each team will put one jammer. The jammer, I, it's all coming back to me now. It's very fun to watch, yes. And so the jammers are the uh, players that score points. Did these items belong to one of the, the women skating? Yeah, so these belong to Kara Penniman of Columbus. She skated under the name Bernadette, and she skated for... Wait, 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 say that again. What was the name? The name was Bernadette. Bernadette. Yeah, oh, I like you can that. actually see it on the back of her uh, jersey right here. Yeah, show it to us. Sure. So the nicknames are kind of part of the, uh, part of it, right? Right. They're known as derby names, and um, usually they'll reflect the player's personality or their playing style. Other skaters choose to just use their personal names, though. See, and these are her skates. That's right. And the helmet. That's right. And the skates also have her uh, derby name on there. Right there, property of Bernadette. <laughs> yeah, I would be. I'd think twice before taking skates from somebody named Bernadette. Is she in the picture? She is. So point her out to us. Let's see, she is right there. Okay, this is, seems like recent items. How old does something have to be before the Ohio History Connection starts considering it? Well, we're always considering objects. The age of the objects is not really of concern to us because the way we see it, we're kind of getting out in front of it and collecting these objects that in 
5, 10, 15, 50 years from now will be really important reminders of um, our culture and, and our society. History is happening now. Most definitely. Speaking of history, this flag looks like the historical flag of Ohio. Let's take a look. Sure. So uh, remind us, uh, the Ohio state flag is has an unusual shape and there's a, there's a word for it. Yeah, it's known as the Ohio Burgee, uh, kind of def one of the iconic design elements is the uh, swallowtail edge that we see over there. And so the Ohio Roller Girls at the time, they chose that design for their flag too, right? Right, so this flag was used during pregame introductions from about 2007 until 2017. You bring up an important point about the name of uh -huh. the league at the time. As you, as you noted, it used to be known as the Ohio Roller Girls. Uh -huh. And then in 2017, they rebranded to Ohio Roller Derby uh, to better represent and reflect the diversity of um, skaters, coaches, volunteers, and others associated with the sport. Remind us about the stars on the Ohio Burgee. How many are there? And how many stars are there on this Burgee and why? So there are 17 stars on the Ohio Burgee, which represents Ohio uh, becoming the 17th state in the country. And the Roller Girls flag that we have here in our collection has 14 stars, one star for each uh, skater that can be placed on a roster at the beginning of a bout. Can you still see Roller Derby in Columbus? Definitely, yeah, the uh, Ohio Roller Derby, uh, generally they have their bouts between February and August, right next door at the Ohio Expo Center. You've got sports on the mind here at Ohio History Connection right now, correct? Certainly, yep. Yeah, actually, we're uh, in the midst of developing a, a new exhibit that's going to be uh, on display at the Ohio History Center here from March 2019 until September 2020. It's going to be called Ohio Champion of Sports, and it's going to show uh, the role that sports has played in Ohio history, and uh, I'm really looking forward to featuring the story of the roller derby squad as well. So, Eric, it's been great to learn about these athletes and their competition, so thanks for sharing these items with us. I've really enjoyed telling you a little bit more about them. Thanks for stopping by, Brent. Curious Seabus is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. Today's question takes us just south of Bexley to Columbus's Berwick neighborhood. The area has strong ties to the city's Jewish and African-American communities, and it's known for its large ranch-style homes and big backyards. Decades ago, as the land transitioned to a residential area, there was a period of time when it was home to nine irons and sand traps. That led one curious resident to ask us, where exactly was the Berwick Golf Course and when did it operate? Using today's streets as a guide, the Berwick Golf Course roughly bordered College Avenue on the east and James Road on the west and ran from Berwick Boulevard south to Scottwood Road. Before the land was developed, it was known as Ambos Park, a spot left wild by its owner as a nature preserve with lakes for fishing. By the spring of 1932, the Columbus Sunday Dispatch reported that, despite the economic depression, the Berwick Construction Company was going ahead with plans to further develop a new subdivision with homes and a golf course. The company placed ads in the paper touting brick homes adjacent to a new golf course under construction. One article reported that the course would even include a modern watering system for the greens. That summer, the golf course was open, and a year later, construction of the clubhouse was completed. The golf course operated for over two decades. Then, in 1955, it was announced that the east section of the course would be replaced by 145 ranch-style homes, with plans to develop the rest of the land by the end of that year. The price for a new Berwick home in 1955? Just a little over 20 grand. Do you have a question for Curious Seabus? Head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea. You can vote on which question we investigate next and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. It's the last game of the season. You're standing out on the mound. Bases loaded, the score is tied, and the batter has a full count. And you're staring in at your catcher. And I 
never been more proud But my heart shakes, buddy, cause dad can't help you now Tower for a lazy fly ball to ride. Now remember that it's just a game. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated. It just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Walgren Wartime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.